Um, happy Sabbath. Um, Good morning, happy Sabbath. How's everyone today? I hear Merry Christmas. Yes, Merry Christmas. So Mary Kay was supposed to be singing, but her voice isn't doing very good things right now. So we have our backups today, and they're going to do awesome. And so I think our first song is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Yeah. Our next song is Go Tell It on the Mountain, uh, number 121 in your hymnal.
Thank you, ladies. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to Standard for Gap. We have several announcements this morning, but first I want to start off by saying that there was something found in the ladies' bathroom that is um, quite valuable. If you have lost something that is usually on one of your fingers, it's quite valuable. And um, if you've lost something, just let me know. Um, and we have some announcements. So. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. If you came in the door out here, you have seen two tables, and they had big pink sheets of paper on it and letters. And we have, this is your new directory. This is the last time it'll be printed this year. But if you find corrections, please, there's a book in the back that I will do corrections on. But, uh, and if you need extra copies, I did have done one a family mostly, uh, unless we have collegiates, then I, I do have there. If you're a member of our church, you receive one of these, and we'd like to give them out as many today as we can. Thank you. Have a good day. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I want to thank the musicians for coming here and uh, making the beautiful music. One of the things that's wonderful about Christmas is all the, 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 uh, the music is, is, you know, praising God for coming and saving us. So thank you for the, the music. I enjoyed that so much. Uh, I'm here again. Uh, we, we put this in the bulletin again. I got one back, but uh, you'll notice from all of the various things that we need several back. We need people helping with the registration, people helping with the food. Uh, and uh, people helping, if so, with setting up and uh, uh, various uh, roles that we have. So uh, I can't do it alone. We did these 12 weeks of wellness pretty much alone, but uh, this here is going to take a lot of help. We need your help, and it's very important uh, to reach out and to meet people where their felt needs are. Uh, there's a big problem in America with diabetes, and so we want to help people. They come to the church, and then they learn about us. So it's not just... Uh, helping them with health. It's also introducing them to, to uh, our church and uh, the, the message that we love. So uh, please uh, look this over, and if you can help uh, fill out, you can put in the box uh, back there on the back or slip it under the pastor's door or hand it to me somehow. Uh, we really uh, we need a lot of help to put this on. So thank you. I shared with you a couple of weeks ago one of our church members, Doriel Smith, a student at Georgia Cumberland Academy, is intending to go on a mission trip to Kenya. He needs money to pay for the trip. Several of you have contributed, and I want to say thank you for those of you who've contributed. We appreciate it a lot, but we're not quite to our goal yet. We still need another $600. I'm looking over the crowd, and if everybody chipped in a little bit, you know, like, $10 a piece, we'd get it. $20 a piece, we'd have it and more. Okay? It doesn't need one person to write check for 600 somebody wants to do that, we'll take your money. <laughs> but if we all chip in a little bit, Morel's got his, tr his trip covered, and he's on his way. Please, ladies and gentlemen, remember Morel Smith, Kenya. All you have to do is K-E-N-Y-A. On your tithe envelope, something for Morel. Thank you. Unless I'm mistaken, this is the last one. But um, if you have this insert in your bulletin, if you would just pull it out. And when I was reading over it, I saw the word free. And whenever I see that, it kind of catches my attention. But under there on the back side, it says, contact us for free assistance in setting up a will or trust. So this is your conference. Your Georgia Cumberland Conference is offering you some free assistance in setting up a will or a trust and, and several other ways that they um, can be a blessing to us also. So that is a a big benefit and something that you might want to consider. So, Our next song is Angels We Have Heard on High. Um, it is 142 in your hymnal.
be seated. Good morning, church family. Um, happy Sabbath to everyone. Our verse for today is found in Micah 5, verses 2 through 5. So I'll give you a chance to get there, and when you get there, please say amen. Micah 5, verses 2 through 5. <laughs> All right, wonderful. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord of his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And he will be our peace when the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses. We will raise against them seven shepherds, even eight commanders. This time you're invited to kneel as we go into our time of prayer. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another and have loved as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for hearing our prayers. This is a sweet and special time of year as we celebrate the birth of Jesus. We come here humbly and praise you for your mighty creation. We thank you for loving us and ask you to come into our hearts so we can share your love with each other and all others around us. And Lord, we pray that we will have no animosity toward anyone, that we forgive anyone who may have done harm to us. If we are angry with anyone, please take that anger away. Please be with those on our prayer list and with all unspoken requests. Be with the homeless people and give us a heart to give them a helping hand. And Father, Please be with our pastor today, and may your words be spoken through him. We ask these words in your precious and holy name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke and chapter 2. Like we did a moment ago, if I could hear amens when we hit the Gospel of Luke and chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. Amen. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 2 with verse 8 and going until verse 14. 
And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. There were two men who went to church one Sabbath morning. Jim Smith, as he attended, he winced when he heard the organist hit an incorrect note a couple of times. He saw a teenager talking when she should have had her eyes closed during prayer. He thought the deacon was judging him when he placed a $5 bill in the offering plate instead of 10 and it made him angry. He caught, as he listened intently to the sermon, five grammatical errors, and it just irked him the rest of the time. As the closing hymn was sung, he quietly and silently slipped out of the side door, thinking to himself, I cannot believe this congregation, what a cloddish bunch of hypocrites, and he went home. Our other gentleman, Ron Jones, went to church on that same Sabbath morning. He heard the organist play an arrangement of a mighty fortress is our God, and his heart rang at the majesty of those words and those notes. He heard a young girl share her testimony about how her faith in Christ had touched her life in a very personal and meaningful way. He was glad to see that his church was involved in alleviating the needs of the poor and the hungry, as they took up a special offering for those in the country of Nigeria. And as he sat through the sermon, it came home to his heart as it answered a question that he had been struggling with in the previous week, and he didn't know quite the answer, but those words that were shared that morning meant something special to him at that time. And as he left the church through the back doors at the end of the closing hymn, he thought to himself, how could someone enter this place and not feel the presence of God? Amen. Well, this is, this is two men who went to church one Sabbath morning, and they had two very different experiences. They went to the same service. So the question that I want you to ponder this morning is, when you come to church, what will you find? What's your purpose? What are you looking for? What will you find? It is time for the, the taking up of the offering. Today's offering, today's loose offering, goes towards a world budget effort, in particular Adventist community services. So that's any monies that are just loosely placed in the offering. If you have a burden on your heart for a special ministry, and I want to encourage you for the faithful returning of your tithes, please put it in an envelope and mark it accordingly. If the deacons would please stand, we'll have our prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all that we have. You are so good and so gracious. We don't deserve it, and yet you so abundantly fill our lives. As we give back, as we return to you what belongs to you, we thank you. We would ask that you bless the tithes, bless the offerings, so they can be multiplied, they can be handled wisely, and I would ask and pray that you bless the people who give. Please be with us today, and may we find you in this worship service. In your name, amen.
It's my privilege to introduce uh, two fellow classmates and externs here at this church, Jeremiah and Chris, as they come up to give our children's story. And as they're coming up and getting ready, boys and girls, this is your time. Please circulate through the, the congregation. Take your time. Wait patiently until those baskets are full as we collect our children's offering and then are blessed with our children's story. And adults, give generously. Thank you. Is this on? Okay. Good morning. Yeah, everyone loves Christmas, right? I just want to share with you what gifts. What do you want? Puppy. Puppy, wow. All right. Uh, slime and uh, hatchables. Slime and hatchables, okay. A kitty. A kitty, okay, so we have a puppy and a kitty. Our parents, are you taking notes? Yeah. All right, right here. A fly fishing pole. A fly fishing pole. A fly fishing pole. It's pretty cool. Okay. Is this better? Okay. All right. Uh, so, yeah, it's Christmas, and a lot of us, we have, we have our, our wish list, right? We have our gifts that we want for Christmas. Chris is going to tell us a story about a Christmas incident that happened in his family. So pay close attention. Well, before I start the story, I just want to know, is there anyone here who's five years old? Raise your hand. Anyone who's five? Okay, whoever is five, you can open this gift. Who wants to open this gift? All right. So she's going to open the gift. And I'll wait till after she's done opening the gift to start the story. What do you think is inside? <laughs> she just wants to get it open. <laughs> yeah, you can rip the paper. Yeah, that's fine. Come on, you can. What is it? A box. Is there anything in the box? Is there anything? No? It's empty? Oh, that doesn't feel very good, does it? Doesn't feel good to get uh, to get an empty box, does it? So I have a story about my dad. He was five years old, and one year for Christmas he got this tiny package from his father, and he opened it up, and all it was was just a little penny pencil, and he just he, he said, 
what? I get this pencil? And, and my, my grandfather, his dad, said, yeah, Chet, that's all you get. And he said, oh, no. And then he started to cry, and he was so sad. And then his mom came to the rescue and said, Henry, what did you do that for? That's so mean. Give him his real present. And he says, okay. So my dad's dad brings out a great big farm set with tractors and animals and fences and a little barn. And my dad opened, opened that gift up and saw it, and he was just so amazed. And he was like, wow, I got this cool farm set. And he said later that that was probably one of his favorite Christmases. But now Jeremiah has a little application for us. So just like how his dad got a little gift. So when we think about Christmas, right, we, we think about gifts, we think about family, we think about snow, we think about Christmas trees. But ultimately... Christmas is about Jesus, right? And the birth of Jesus. You have a Christmas tree out? Wow. Wow. Three Christmas trees. All right. So, so Christmas is about Jesus, right? And so when Jesus, when Jesus, before Jesus came to earth, you know, the Israelites were expecting a Messiah. They were expecting a great king who would set them free, right? And what really came was what? A baby, right? A little baby. They wanted a Messiah. They wanted a conqueror. And God sent a little baby. They were like, what? Like, this is it? Like, that that can't be the gift. But we know that the ultimate gift wasn't just that Jesus came down as a baby, but he paid the ultimate price on the cross. For what? So that we could live forever, right? So that we could live with him in heaven. And that is the ultimate gift that God has for us. So as you as you spend time with your family this Christmas ho- season and spend time with your friends and you open your gifts and you give gifts to others, think about the gift that Jesus gave you, and that's the gift of eternal life. All right, you guys can go back to your seats now.
Thank you, Deep Six. Your offertory as well as your special music. Happy Sabbath to you. Along with Chris, the Christmas season, not only is there gifts and Christmas trees and the birth of Jesus, there's also sickness sometimes too. So my voice, as you can tell, um, has been influenced by a sinus infection. So uh, my prayer is that you will be able to bear with me. I want to do something that we, I do traditionally throughout ministry each year, either the Sabbath before or maybe two Sabbaths before Christmas, is read a special Christmas story. And the stories come generally from Dr. Wheeler's Christmas in My Heart. And I have one of those stories today. The Carols of Bethlehem Central by Frederick Hall. The Carols of Bethlehem Central. This story is taken from close to a hundred years ago. And it's a very profound story that not only tugs at our mind, but our hearts as well. So I invite you to listen to the story of the carols of Bethlehem Central. There might have been no church had not the Reverend James McKenzie come just when it seemed tottering to a fall. There might have been no Sunday school had not Harold Thornton tended it as carefully as he attended his own orchard. There might have been no class number four had it not been for Gertrude Winsor. But there would have been no glad tidings in one wintry heart save for the voices with which Eddie and the two Willies and Charlie and little Phil sang the carols that morning in the snow. And they came straight from him who gave the angels the songs of on earth, peace, goodwill to men. At the end of the winter term in Gertrude's junior year, at the, the doctor had prescribed a year of rest for her. And she had come to find it with Aunt Patella in the quiet of Bethlehem Central. On her first Sunday, she attended a little Sunday school, and at the close of the service, there was an official conference. She would be just the one if she would, said the pastor. It can't go on as it is, answered the superintendent. The deacon means well, but he doesn't know boys. There wasn't one here today, and only Eddie last Sunday. I wish she'd be chorister, too. Did you hear her sing? I doubt if she would do that. I am told she nearly broke down in college and is here to rest. Yes, so Mr. Thompson told me. But we do need her. Well, I will call on her and let you know what I learned. Gertrude hesitated. For had not the doctor said, it is not so much college, Miss Windsor, it is church and Sunday school and Christian endeavor and student volunteer and all the rest on top of college work. That is what's breaking you down and you must stop it now. But the wistful face of Harry who brought their milk decided her. And the second Sunday saw her instructing Eddie and little Phil in the quarterly temperance lesson. It was not until school was over that she learned the, re the reason for little Phil's conscious silence. And next day, when she met him with his father on the street, she tried to atone for her former ignorance. Are you Phil's father, she asked, stepping towards them. Tim Charteau, who was believed by some to fear neither God, man, nor the devil, grew strangely embarrassed as he took her hand after a hurried inspection of his own. Yes, sum he answered. I am to be his Sunday school teacher, she went on. And of course, I want to know the fathers and mothers of my boys. I hope Phil can come regularly. We are going to have some very interesting lessons. I guess he can come, answered his father. 
it's a better place for him than on the street anyway. This was faint praise, but well meant. Gertrude smiled her appreciation, and in that brief meeting, one not only fills lifelong regard, but had she known it, that of the father as well. For thenceforth, Tim Charteau felt that he had two friends in Bethlehem Center, of whom he need not be ashamed. His other friend was the Reverend James McKenzie. The mutual, though, qualified respect they felt for each other dated from that their first meeting when Mr. McKenzie had walked into the saloon and asked permission to tack up some bills advertising his revival services. I guess you can, the proprietor had answered, standing alertly on his guard. The bills had been posted and the unwanted visitor turned to the man behind the bar. They were alone together now. We should be very glad, Mr. Charteau, he said, if you would attend some of the meetings too. It'll be a cold day when I do, answered the saloon keeper. Mr. McKenzie did not reply, but Tim said, by way of an explanation, the worst enemies I've got are in that church. A smile lightened up the pastor's earnest face. No, Mr. Charteau, he said, you're wrong. They don't like your business. I don't like your business. But you have an enemy in our church. And I want to tell you now, his foot was upon the bar rail, and he was looking straight into the eyes of the man to whom he spoke, that every night, as I pray that God will remove this saloon, I shall pray that he will bring you to know my Savior. And if ever you need help that I can give, I want you to feel free to come to me you are traveling, we are traveling different roads, Mr. Charteau, but we are not enemies. We are friends. And the pastor departed, leaving Tim, the saloon keeper, that shook up, to use his own phrase, that it is doubtful whether he ever entirely regained his former attitude towards them church folks. By Gertrude's second Sunday as teacher, the two willies had come to test the truth of rumors that had reached them. Charlie and Harry came next, and after Gertrude announced the midweek class meetings as a reward for full attendance, not one absence occurred for 13 weeks. To Harold Thornton, it had the look of a miracle that the class for whom no teacher could be found was as clay in the hands of the potter. There was nothing Gertrude could not do with them. They listened spellbound when she talked, took part, in the, took part in the responsive readings, answered questions, studied their lessons, sat wherever the superintendent wished. They even pocketed their papers without a glance at them until the session was over. And they sang with a wild abandon that was exhilarating to hear. Even Harry, who held throughout the note on which his voice first fastened never failed to sing. And though it added little to the harmony, it spoke volumes for the spirit of the school and the devotion to the chorister. But if Gertrude was doing much for the boys, they were doing much more for Gertrude. And obeying her orders to rest, exercise, grow strong, she could not have had better helpers. From the time when the first pale blossoms of the blood root showed beside the snow, through the seasons of violets and wild strawberries and goldenrod, to the time when the frost had spread the ground with the split shocks of the hickory nuts, the spoil of all the woodland was brought to her. Their class meetings became long tramps during which Gertrude told them interesting things about insects, birds, and flowers, and they told as much that was strange to her. Every one of them had become a conspirator in the plot to keep her out of doors, away from her books. Hardly a day passed that she did not go somewhere with one or more of them. And as the healthy color began to show beneath the tan, so as strength came back and every pulse beat 
brought the returning joy of life, she often felt that all her work for class number four had been repaid a hundredfold. It was one mid-August afternoon when the tasseled corn stood high and the thistles had begun to take wing and fly away to join the dandelions that there came the first thoughts of the carols. Harry had to drive cows that day, but the others were with her. And as they came out through Mr. Gritz's woods and looked down upon the pasture where the sheep were feeding, little Phil began the quaint old version of the shepherd's song, psalm that she had taught them. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie. And the other boys joined, singing through to the end. It was beautiful. She had never realized that they could sing so well. Suddenly, as she listened, the plan came full growth into her mind, and she proposed it then and there. The boys were jubilant. For a half hour, they discussed details, and then, all seated on the ground, like those of whom they sang, she taught them the beginnings of while shepherds watch their flocks by night. That was the first of many open-air rehearsals that transferred. When the weather grew colder to Willie Gritz's, where there was no near neighbors to whom the preposterous secret might leak out, there was not one defective voice in the class save Harry's, and he was at first a puzzle. But that difficulty vanished when it was learned that his fondest ambition was satisfied by striking the tuning fork. Thereafter, all went smoothly with much enthusiasm and a world of mystery. When the program was complete, they had learned by heart six songs, while shepherds watched their flocks by night, away in the manger, we three kings of Orient are, Hark the herald angels sing, there came three kings ere break of day, and last, but best, because it seemed especially made for them, the song that began, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie, above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. And so at length came Christmas Eve, Little eyes were closing tight in determined efforts to force the sleep that would make the time till morning so much shorter. But in Bethlehem Center were six boys who, it is safe to say, were thinking less of the morrow's gifts than of the morning's plan. For preparations for early rising had been as elaborate as if it were 4th of July. And there was a solemn agreement that not one present should be looked at until after their return. Gertrude had fallen asleep, thinking of the letter beneath her pillow that promised her return to college at the beginning of next term. But at the first tinkle of her alarm clock, she was up and dressing by candlelight, went softly down the stairs and out into the keen air of the morning. The stars were still bright overhead and there was no light in the east. But Gertrude Windsor was not the first abroad. For at the gate, Eddie, the two Willies, and little foot, Phil stood waiting and Harry and Charlie were seen coming at top speed. Are we all here? asked Eddie in a stage whisper. And the other boys huddled close together and wiggled with suppressed excitement. Yes, answered, answered Gertrude. Which place is first? Mr. McKenzie, announced Charlie, whose part it was to lay out the route. And crossing the road, they passed through the parsonage gate. Beneath the study windows, Harry, at given signal, struck the tuning fork against his boot heel. Gertrude gave the key, and then, like one, there rose a great dawning of another Christmas day, those Clear young voices singing, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconcile. 
There were sounds from within before they had finished the first stanza. But when, after the amen, the pastor started to open the window, the boys were too quick for him. There was a volley of Merry Christmas, and his answer reached only the rear guard, tumbling over the picketed fence. Beneath the, beneath the bare apple tree boughs in Harold Thornton's yard, Charlie, Eddie, and little Phil sang, We three kings of Orient are, while the others joined in the chorus. At the song's close, the superintendent, swiffer of foot than the pastor, overtook them with a great box of candy to give them. Tears came into the eyes of Mrs. Martin as, watching beside her sick child, she heard again the story of the babe away in a manger, no crib for his bed. Old Uncle King forgot for a moment his vexing troubles as he listened to the admonition to rest beside the weary road and hear the angels sing. Mrs. Finney cried as sick people will when she heard the boy's sweet triumphant notes. So from house to house the singers went, pausing at one because of sickness, at another because those within were lonely, at some for love as they had serenaded the pastor and the superintendent and bringing to each some new joy. The stars were fading out now and they had started to, re as they started to return. On their side of the street was the post office and opposite them was the saloon with its gaudy glit sign, Tim's Place. Little Phil was behind Gertrude as they passed that building it was home to him. His hand just touched her sleeve. D do you think, he whispered, and she could see the pitiful quiver of his chin as he spoke. D do you suppose we could sing one for a mere father? Tear tears filled Gertrude's eyes. And has she not known boys so well, she would have stooped and caught him up in her arms. Why, surely, she answered, which one do you think your father would like best? Phil had shrunk behind her now, and beneath the gaze of the other boys, his eyes were those of a little hunted animal at bay. Bethlehem, he said huskily, Bethlehem. And when Harry had struck the tuning fork, they began to sing together, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above Thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. The 24th had been a good day for business in Tim Chartaud's place. He had had venison for free lunch. Two mandolin and guitar players had been there all evening, and there was more than 200 in the till. But now, in the quiet of the early morning, as he sat alone, the reaction had come. He remembered how Rob had too much and gone home to his wife who had toiled all day at the wash tub. He thought of the fight of, between Joe and Tom. He did not drink much himself. He actually despised a drunkard. But yet these things disgusted him. There was little Phil too, the saloon keeper's boy. And that cut deep to him. Wouldn't it pay better in the long run? And then the music floated softly in. He did not hear the words at first, but he had a, a good ear. It was the singing that had brought him as a boy into the beer gardens. Stepping to the window, he listened, all unseen by those without. There the words reached him. He silent, how silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessing of his heaven. No may, ear may hear his coming, but in the world of sin, where meek souls will receive him. And until they sang the amen, Tim Sharto never stirred from the window. The storm that had been threatening all day had descended. Without a, without a blizzard was raging. But within, beside his study fire, the little boys tucked away in bed upstairs in a book in his hand, the pastor Mackenzie could laugh at weather. But then a knock. 
a knock at that hour? He was surprised. But when he saw who stood upon his threshold, he was even more surprised. He knew how the saloon keeper felt when he posted his bills so many months before. Good evening, Mr. Charteau, he said. Won't you come in? The face of his visitor was tense and haggard, for the struggle had lasted the whole day long. I've come for help, he answered shortly. I guess it's the kind only you can give. All right. For a moment, the pastor searched his face. God bless you, he exclaimed. Come in, come in. And so was wrought again before the close of that day, that Christmas day that had been ushered in by the singing of those little carols, the ever new miracle of Christmas, where God's gift to men had been again accepted and into another heart made meek and ready to receive him, the dear Christ had entered. As Chris and Jeremiah reminded us, the Christmas trees can be beautiful and beautifully decorated. The garland can be out. The stockings can be hung. There can be gifts beautifully wrapped under a tree. But the real gift is Jesus. Amen. All of those things pale in comparison, as we're reminded in our children's story. You can have everything and really have nothing. Or we can have Jesus and have everything, even if our bank accounts are scant. The question for each of us in this Christmas season, just like it was for Mr. Charteau, the saloon keeper, what will you do with the Christ child? Actually, no. What will you do with Christ, the Messiah? The one that was prophesied in Malachi 5 to come. The one that God had longed to birth into the history of our world. What will you do with Christ Jesus, the Messiah? Is he here forever, friend? Is he the God and Savior and Lord of your life? He became that way for Mr. Charteau. Is it that way for you as well? Or is it the tinsel and the presents and the eating? As nice as all of those are. The real reason for the season is Jesus. Amen. I know that's an overused statement, but it's still true. Luke chapter 2, as the angels come to those shepherds, with a shock, startled look at just one angel, let alone when the sky lit up with all of the angels, who couldn't hold in any longer the joyous announcement that they had waited to share with humanity. It says this in verse 11 of Luke 2. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. But as Chris and Jeremiah remind us in the children's story, they had to have a little description because what they were expecting was different than what God was giving. <laughs> and, this, and the angels go on and say in verse 12, And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. God's way is never our way, and God's way does not make sense to us as human beings. But God's way is the best way. And God's best way is our salvation. Amen. 
and hope and comfort, even in the midst of loss and grief and disappointment. This time Cindy is going to come. I want to share a Christmas blessing with you and then share with you something special that we have for you this Christmas season. This is a happy time for our family. It's a Christmas family blessing. And on this Christmas Sabbath, it is a day to proclaim what Isaiah said of Jesus to come as a babe in the manger. He would be our peace, our king. He would bind up the brokenhearted and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The babe, once laid in Bethlehem's stall, is now risen, now pleading, now reigning. He longs to be your comfort, your peace, your strength, and your wholeness at this Christmas season and throughout the new year. Let your heart open to receive him and welcome him today. At the close of the service, um, while we're singing the closing hymn, we will be going through the sanctuary with just a token of our love and care for you as our church family. Thank you for your care for us throughout the year. For unto us a child is born, Unto us a son is given, and the government be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And may this peace abide in your hearts throughout this year and forevermore. Amen. We invite you to remain seated as we're led in our closing hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And as, we, as we're singing, we will come by to share the gift that we have from our family to your family. And at the end, our organist will just play and lead us right in since we've already had our benediction blessing.